made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession. This week's episode is brought to you by Close for Cairo, Dr. Barbara Eaton's 56-day chiropractic boot camp, Moveball University, The Black Diamond Club, Legacy Wealth Management, Posture Screen, Dr. Alok Trevetti, Universal Traction Systems, Vantage Point Marketing, Element Mattresses, Imaging Services, Zingit Solutions, Cairo Thin, Dr. Peter Goldman's Zone School of Healing, and Everest Chiropractic Boot Camp. Let's hustle. Hey guys, welcome to episode 65 of Cairo Hustle. I'm your co-host Luke Millette, and here's your host Jim Chester. So today we had the opportunity of interviewing Dean DePice. He is the living legend and he helped uh, bring to light the TLC movement. If you want to know what that acronym stands for, stay tuned. What is your chiropractic story and what influenced you to become a chiropractor? You know, I love that question because it puts me in the place of the happiness that got me here. So um, my mom had me getting adjusted since I was born. My two brothers are much older than me and by the time she had me, she had been through some health challenges that she was rescued by chiropractic. So by the time she had me, she decided she was going to raise me differently. So when I got sick, when I got chicken pox, I got meals, I got anything. My mom brought me to the chiropractor as a, as a baby back in you know the, the early 60s, late 50s. She was in her chiropractic development story. So um, I've been getting adjusted since I was born. I My mom had me, I took one vaccine, got sick, and she said, you know what, this is nuts too. And she stopped me on all vaccines. So, you know, this was way before anybody thought about saying no to doctors and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so chiropractic, by the time I remember I was 10, 11, 12, 13, my mom would keep a $5 bill in an envelope in the dresser drawer in our row home in her bedroom. And when we wanted to go to the chiropractor, we'd go in her room, we'd get the envelope out, take a $5 bill and say, we're going to the chiropractor. And we were at liberty to get adjusted as much as we want, but never less than once a month. And that was one of her proclamations. So I remember when I would lay there on the table and this guy would take my occiput and my neck in his hands in the supine position. I just remember laying there and knowing his hands were safe. And what was going to come from his hands through my neck would be good. And I didn't understand much more than that. And then when he would stand me up and occasionally put me on the toggle table sideways, it was like I had no clue what kind of a hand grenade was going off, but that thing was going to make goodness be even greater. And so I just always had this experience, but I was very much immersed in classical studies. I was studying classical guitar. I was in Manhattan with uh, virtuosos from all over the world training. And by the time I went to college, I was in Manus Music Conservatory with the world's most aggressive agenda of classical study that there was. So chiropractic was not even on the radar screen. But when a sequence of events took me on a different course, and I said, you know, I'm out of here and I'm leaving the conservatory. Um, I decided I was going to take a quarter of just going to college still, but I wasn't going to proclaim a major or anything. And within no time flat, my chiropractor was, you know, on my case, you need to become a chiropractor. And he met me late at night and did this thing. And I had another guy in the family who told me I have to become a surgeon because his name was Ralph Loy and he was a surgeon and he wanted me to follow in those steps. So, you know, these people were knocking on my door because they knew I was classically disciplined to be great at whatever I did because they saw what I did in classical music. Um, and again, it was like the moment when my occiput in my neck laid in his hands and I knew what was about to happen was good. Um, when I looked at all my options, which was really infinite, anything was possible. I was a great study. I knew how to work hard. Um, chiropractic was good. And so I double majored in biology uh, 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 biology and chemistry and did a minor in nutrition. I got my bachelor degree uh, in New Jersey at Montclair State College, now Montclair University. And um, 
then I went down and I, I hitchhiked around the country to tour a bunch of schools. Once I was done with as many schools as I could get to, a classmate in college said, you know, I haven't checked out Sherman in life. And she was looking to go to Caribbean too. I said, well, you know, well, let's go. And she said, well, I don't have a car. So I said, well, I have the car. You pay for the gas. We'll go. <laughs> <laughs> so we made a deal. We went down and uh, we visited both Sherman and Life. Loved both of them, but we knew more people at Life. We went there, and chiropractic has been a beacon that always connected me to what truth was. And from truth, all decisions were always the most right. So that's a little bit of my story. That was a long-winded answer, but I love remembering that man's hands holding my occiput in my neck. Man, that's so beautiful. Uh, it, it just really resonates with so many of our listeners as to what the first, you know, influence of chiropractic was into their lives as well. And, mm. you know, for those that don't know you, Dr. Dean, how, how long have you been at it as a chiropractor? Since 1987. Oh, boy. So, you, so you, you, you've been out there serving frontline uh, chiropractic for a long time. Long time. Long time, yes. Your uh, career is almost as long as my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why when you were talking about somebody who's uh, in my neighborhood here and you say, oh, he's out of a decade. So I said, oh, he's a youngster yet. He's just getting started. Um, you know, I'm sure somebody who's 50 years in the game looks at me and says that. Um, so, yes, I, I've been at it a few years, but I feel like I am every day born again into what a blessing it is to be a chiropractor. I mean, this is like, it's crazy not to be working around the clock as a chiropractor because there's just infinite potential to serve infinite numbers of people with infinite prosperity attached to it. So I love it. I love how precise you are and how excited you are, man, after so long. Definitely. <laughs> so what makes you unique in the chiropractic world? I know you have a group called TLC. You want to elaborate on that a little bit for everybody? Uh, boy, what makes me unique? Yes. Um, I love connection with people. I love connecting. I love feeling connection. I love being a facilitator of connection with people. And because of that, everything I've done has always been about bringing connection between people. Uh, ironically, I guess, from brain to body and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. But more importantly, um, in terms of what you're asking in the profession, I bring leaders in the profession together. I bring chiropractors together. And really, what we've done in TLC, you know, my wife and I have been in practice forever. She's a chiropractor. We delivered our kids at home. We homeschooled them. We, you know, when we got going here, we said this profession does not need another practice management group. Yet so many living rooms we were in fell short of things we wished for. And so we said, well, you know, this group was great for philosophy, but, you know, many times people were collecting $8 a visit or couldn't pay their bills or whatever. And this group was great for practice management and whatnot, but they had no heart for, for the foundations of chiropractic. And this group seemed great about a business acumen, but most people were on their third or fourth marriage. And I believe that when Jen and I sat down, we were like, this has to happen because so many people would come to live with us. People who worked on brain injury recovery work for their children would come and live with us with their kids for weeks at a time, months at a time. People who wanted to see our practice would come and spend days at a time in our office. Um, people who knew us from other venues would come monthly to do trainings at our facility. So we, you know, within eight, nine, ten years of practice, we had hundreds of people that used DePice Chiropractic as a place to learn about things. And the biggest thing I always said to them was, if your marriage isn't intact, go home and work on that because I'm not going to help you in your practice if your marriage sucks. So, you know, there was just a lot of fundamental, basic stuff I said to people that they were like, uh, okay. So it was kind of like, uh, um, you know, life is a box of chocolates. Who is that? Uh, Forrest Gump? Forrest Gump, you know, it, it was like he did. They, he just went and did what the guy said, play ping pong. Okay, he played ping pong. So people started to work on this. They said, well, this really works. It's, it, it's almost like just basic truth of life. And yeah, so TLC, what we said is um, 
if your home, you know, nobody's practice is ever going to be more full of joy and prosperity than their marriage and home life is full of joy and prosperity. To the degree that a man or a woman is miserable in their home life, that is somehow going to make things miserable in their practice life. And it doesn't start with, with you know, your vocation. It starts with your worldview and your marriage and your home life. So we said that's got to be intact. And then people have to learn self-worth and value. If you don't have self-worth for yourself, you're never going to demand that people pay full value for your vocational service unto them. I don't care whether you're a painter or a lands, uh, landscaper, a neurosurgeon, or a, uh, you know, a fence builder. You know, if you got self-esteem and self-worth problems, your finances are always going to suck. So then you got to deal with your core values about your own self-worth. So instead of constantly focusing on practice management, stop it. Work on you. So the TLC community is just that. It's not another practice management firm. The, pra the profession we are in is drowning in that stuff. What we need is people who stop pursuing shiny objects and they start working on core values of their soul, their worldview, their vertical relationships, their home life, their marriage. And, and when you can uplift and want to protect the sanctity of one's home life, business is going to be simple. So you asked me the question of, you know, how does this work out? How does it play? TLC is about raising up the personal life of the individual before the business life of the individual. I think that's what makes us unique. No contracts. I'm sick and disgusted by the people that, you know, manipulate situations with people and try to get chiropractors into contracts a year, two years, five years. If I'm serving someone, why the heck would I have to handcuff them financially to something? Stop it already. And uh, so you sense I had emotions about that one. There's a bunch of them I have emotions about, but protect marriages, protect home life, raise up people's core values, and stop thinking you need to you know, have a gimmick sales line to it. Tell them the truth, and if people are ready to change, they're going to swim towards you, and you swim towards them. So That's awesome. I, I couldn't agree more. Yep. So yep. would you mind sharing some of your favorite quotes, mantras, or uh, – motivational words of wisdom that keep you fired up about what you do oh boy what a mantra well one for me is discipline equals freedom you know i love how counterintuitive that statement is because the world attaches emotional charge to words right so classically in our civilization the word discipline has a negative emotional initial charge to it yet I was just reading a beautiful book. I forget the title of it. There's somebody sitting on my nightstand. But it said, um, the degree to which one wants to feel joy in their lives will never be greater than the degree to which they live with discipline. Discipline equals freedom. When one is disciplined in how they maintain, take care of a car, and drive a car, then they are free to ride the envelope of performance around a turn and have fun yet be safe. That's great. You know, I love race cars, and I know the power that a car has to destroy life and to enhance the thrill of the adrenal reflex of the giggles of life. And therefore, I have to be very disciplined to ride the line. You know, an IndyCar, a NASCAR has a line that at 200 miles an hour, you can vary much more than about 24 inches left or right of the center line if you want to ride the envelope of performance that can spill, spell the greatest experience or the worst experience in that car. You don't get to play with that intensity if you're not a man or woman who lives with discipline. So many people want to get into practice and find the simple way to, well, I'm just going to, I'm not going to bill insurance, so then my life will be happy. Well, okay, what other delusional statements have you sold to yourself? You know, it's got nothing to do with insurance. And if you don't want insurance, great, get rid of insurance. I don't care whether you're in insurance or not insurance, but don't act like that's the thing that's going to help you find joy. You need to be so disciplined that it doesn't matter what's going on in the circumstances around you. You're a solid dude. You're a solid gal. You're a solid person. You're a solid parent. You know, we make we make ourselves so frail and undisciplined that any breeze blowing around us in the circumstances of the world around us take us off course. So discipline equals freedom would definitely be one of my statements. Another one. Train like it's real. So when it's real, it's just like training. I didn't invent that. Like most things, no one invented anything. It's just a recycle of other things. That's something the Navy SEALs recycled from something that's Old Testament. You know, when you live with incredible discipline and training so that you are 
competent at what might happen, well then when mu- what might happen happens, it's just like you were training in discipline. So you're not shocked, you're not screaming, running around like your hair's on fire, you're cool, you know? And uh, I remember as a little kid, it was one of my things my dad taught me about the subway. He said, okay, we're gonna learn to ride the subways in New York now. I was like eight years old, and, he's, and one of the things I remember him telling me is, most, most important is that you always don't just look cool, but deep inside you remain cool. And by him, he meant temperature, you know, because people, when people get hot and start to perspire, perspire, it's like, you know, you're the target for the rabid dog that sees you as the, you know, the next tasty piece of meat. You got to be cool. And you don't get to be cool if you're not trained in discipline. So train like it's real. So when it's real, it's just like training, you know. Um, and you can't have sustainable growth unless you choose wisely the men and women you surround yourself with. So the final quote would be, if you want to be extraordinary, you must have a coach. Even people who claim they're not coaching with someone, that in themselves is evidence that they've worked through and are working through coaching. They might be doing it secretly or more quietly or in you know, other venues, but you know, the truly, I mean, there's nobody in the highest levels of the golf world right now or the soccer world right now or anything that people pay thousands of dollars a ticket to go see, they're not seeing anyone that isn't and hasn't been under unimaginably rigorous coaching. And we have chiropractors coming out of school acting like the, well, I don't need a coach or I don't need training. I mean, you're a knucklehead. <laughs> you've got to choose a coach and not only choose the coach, but you've got to choose incredibly wisely. You know, the coach has to be balanced. The coach can't be owing the IRS money. The coach can't be, you know, through 17 conflicts of home life and relationship development. The coach, the coach has to have balance. The coach has to have had decades of prosperous practice life before they're going to stand on a podium and act like there's something to teach. You know, I'm amazed at how many people are, you know, barely a year or two in the game and then they're selling their conversations for wisdom on platforms acting like, you know, and we live in a world where with social media, you can have virtually no competency in anything and look like you have competency at everything. So you really have to not only choose a coach, but you have to choose them with great wisdom. So... Yeah, going going back to your coaching program, what does TLC stand for, and what do you think the chiropractic profession might look like if more doctors took your training program? Well, the third letter, C, stands for conditioning, and one of the things we understand in conditioning is that it's never not happening, and we could just end this whole conversation right there. <laughs> conditioning is never not happening. Which means even if you say, well, I'm not at the gym right now, well, then you're conditioning your body to not be at the gym. Or if you say, well, I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not worrying about what I eat right now, good, then you're conditioning yourself to not worry about what you eat. Well, I'm not worried about dropping F-bombs right now because I'm in this circle. Great, so you're convincing yourself that dropping F-bombs and having you know, that kind of thing is okay. Whatever, whatever you're doing, you're conditioning yourself that doing that is going to happen more. Good or bad, ideal or not, fit or fumbled, whatever it is, conditioning is happening all the time. It's never not happening. Number two, the second level. Life. Every moment of life, you are rendering care to it. So, you know, some people say, oh, well, Lee, are, are you one of those doctors going to make me come back forever? Are you, you're the one of those guys that sells lifetime care. Well, listen, if you're breathing, you're having life. If you're in life, everything you're doing is rendering care to it. So lifetime care is not an option. <laughs> the question is, what the heck are you doing about your lifetime care? Have you deliberately chosen the wisest of behaviors, the most ideal of applications, the most well-adjusted thinking, physical active choosing way of engaging life you know lifetime care is not an option the question is what character and quality of lifetime care are you carrying out so as doctors of chiropractic to patients patients have spines they're breathing they need to get it checked the rest of their life what is your lifetime agenda so the second word stands for life because each individual is always in conditioning and how we are as individuals in our conditioning affect the first letter which is we are constantly in teamship with each other. It is through each other together that the world is shaped. Pollution is made worse or cleanliness made greater, greater, that love moves more forward or envy and greed takes the stage. Teams and lives 
in conditioning is what TLC means. That we are constantly in conditioning, first ourselves, and then secondarily with everyone we come in contact with. So that's the title. You asked me a second question in there, though. What was the other question? Oh, what might be different? Um, well, if the world weren't constantly being hoodwinked into contracts with things, if the world weren't constantly being seduced into shiny objects to fix things from outside in, including kind of, ironically, chiropractors are here talking about wanting to help the body heal from inside out, and most of them are looking for solutions to their new patient problems or whatever that they can buy from outside in. It's kind of funny if you think about it. Um, if the TLC, well, I can't even say if, I mean, the TLC community is just exponentially deepening itself in the love of, of civilization as well as chiropractic as more and more of the profession immerses itself in TLC. They're going to learn that true healing happens because community grows greater in its ideal connections. TLC is about people coming alongside people. Obviously choosing the most wise and ideal and virtuous behaviors, thoughts, words, and actions. But that it is in community that men and women are exposed. Because one of the things we say, and you can write this down, it's a beautiful sequence I teach on some of my slides. It's one of our, our isms. When people come together, they commune. When people commune, even if it's just at the junction of a doorway, one points to the other you go first or I'll hold the door. People who commune, communicate. When men and women communicate, then they have a sense on the other side of the threshold of that moment that they are now in a mutual community. And when men and women experience community, there is a sense of trust that shows up. So now they can have confidence and a sense of transparency. And when men and women allow there to be transparency because of their sense of safety and community, men and women can be held accountable. And it is when men and women hold each other accountable that they can make the wisest choices. For when men and women know their life is on a movie screen being viewed by others, they rarely choose the dark path. They always choose the highest ground. So in TLC, we emphasize that TLC is a great deal of great procedures and disciplines, but mostly it's extraordinary community raising each other up in choices. Yeah, I like a lot of what you say, Dean. I think that there's a lot of people that are going to really benefit from this episode, learning about you know personal responsibility and mindset and motivation and what it means to be a large team member, what it means to be a singlepreneur, uh, people that are out there you know, struggling in practice might listen to this and say, wow, I resonate with what Dean says and uh, he has a really good message. And uh, I'm interested more in this TLC stuff that he does. Um, but I, I guess this next question is a little bit, uh, we're going to go and rewind. I want to ask you something that is off script a little bit. And it's, what do you think is the most important thing to happen to the chiropractic profession in the past 10 years? <sighs> Well, I guess there's important or significant, those are two different words, and then there is important or significant that has been constructive in a positive way or destructive in a negative way. Um, hmm. Let's follow all those rabbit trails. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to go to the high ground and say, what do I think is the most positive thing that I have seen happen? Um, I believe that an increasing number of people are um, choosing to really publish, experience, and express what happens when the central nervous system is given every opportunity to work its best. In other words, you know, there's a bit, there was a movement in the profession, well, there still is, to say that we need to become evident, more evidence-based. Well, to say the profession needs to become evidence-based is to suggest that the profession isn't what? Evidence-based. Evidence and evidence-based research leans heavy upon clinical research. Clinical research says what are the outcomes of the patient-doctor experience or the medium or, or uh, service being provided. Well, if you think about it, let's get legitimate with that conversation. 
what's the reason 120 plus years in we're still here? Is it because um, medicine has referred to us exhaustively? No. <laughs> Are we here 120 years later because Hollywood has portrayed us in movies and sitcoms as incredibly virtuous souls that everyone should visit? No. Think about this. The reason we're here is because doctors and patients know chiropractic what? It works. People come in for low back pain, they end up conceiving children. People come in for neck issues and their allergies go away. We've known for a century plus that chiropractic works. If that's the case, if the reason we're here is because of results, think about how silly what I said a moment ago was. There's never been lack of evidence. So to say we need to become evidence-based means someone at the helm of thinking that through was not on the sharpest day of their cognizance. They really didn't have their game as polished as could be, but we as a profession bought it hook, line, and sinker. So what's really important and good is that we have a lot of people now, not just Heidi Havoc, but a lot of people who are revealing that the fact is there is zero lack of evidence in chiropractic. Now, the issue to comprehend, I believe, and I teach this in my CE programs, is um, that we as a profession don't tend to attract people whose excitement is sitting down and getting published. We don't attract people whose excitement is sitting down and bean counting numbers to get data published into research. Chiropractic as a profession tends to attract people who are very passionate about the hands-on experience of being in practice or being with patients or adjusting people and whatnot. Well, those people don't tend to make the best at getting published. So I think the leadership of our profession would have served us greater if they said, you know what? You guys really have challenges with getting published. You have challenges with documentation. Ask, ask any third-party payer. Yeah, you know, Chiropractic has one of the worst track records of documentation. So what we would have been wise to do as leadership in our profession would be for colleges, state associations to say, look, there is no lack of evidence in this profession. However, we tend to not publish as much of it as we would be wise to. So we're going to go on an initiative to get all of our case studies published. Because the clinical research of chiropractic is voluminous, but the publishing of it could be greater. And since we do encourage evidence-based processes, as the whole world does, no one's going to win at the evidence game better than chiropractors. Let's just get it published. I think these conversations are wonderful, and I think the best thing is books like what Heidi Havoc put, put out. I think the ability for us to Google and search, you know, parallel research. There's, a, there's research in medicine. Uh, that had to do with respiratory illnesses, and it found that people with kyphotic spines who had emphysema were 144% more likely to die from their respiratory challenges just because they had a subluxated thoracic spine. Well, that wasn't chiropractic research. That was medical research, but it was completely parallel to what chiropractic was working with. So I love how much science continues to slowly catch up to what chiropractic always knew. It's almost third-party validation. Yeah, yeah. Not that we should need it or seek it, but it's there. So on one of those uh, topics you, you touched on was Heidi Havoc, and I know she does a lot with uh, the brain. And a uh, really cool story quick. I was out doing a screening event in Denver over the weekend, and this little girl came up and asked me what I was doing. I go, oh, well, we have a chiropractic booth here, and we're scheduling people in for chiropractic visits. And she goes, well, what is that? And I go, well, here, here's a spinal model that you can have a look at. And this is your nervous system. It flows from the top of your head all the way down to your tailbone. And it controls all the uh, movement in your body and your health. And she's mm. like, wow, no one's ever told me that before. And she was like nine. And I was like, well, um, this part up here, if this is out of alignment, I was pointing to the atlas. I go, everything's off then. And she mm. goes, well, what's above it? I go, well, that's your brain. And she goes, well, does the spine control your brain too? I go, yes, it does. So if you have something going on in your neck or in your back, it's going to have an upstream effect as well as a downstream effect that's having either a positive or a negative effect on your health. And when that spine is in motion, it has mobility to it, your body and your quality of life is going to be better. <laughs> and she looked over to her mom, man, and she's like, did you know that the body worked like that? <laughs> mm. uh -oh. That's beautiful. 
<laughs> and I just sat there and I explained to her, I said, well, uh, if you ever want to think about having your daughter become a future chiropractor, here's my card. <laughs> right, right, right. It's neat how, how logical things can be when the mind isn't chattered up with other stuff, right? Yeah, and you know, no pre preconceived notions of whether chiropractic is good or bad. Uh, the little girl just wanted to know more about what I was doing and how the spine worked and what it controlled. And I went on to tell her that right here, if this is a segment that's out of alignment, and I showed her on a somatic chart, where does that nerve go to? She goes, wow, that goes to your heart. And I go, yeah, so just say that your back was out of alignment and it had tension there, what it would do for your health of your heart. She goes, it's probably not going to be good, right? Mm. So, right. you know, it's the simplest we can correlate things to even the most juvenile mind makes sense to even the greatest minds out there. And that's mm. really the truth in chiropractic. Right. right. Beautiful. So tell us, where do you see the chiropractic profession in the next 20 years? Uh, boy, where would it be in the next 20 years? Well... I guess like my answer to the individual DCs, you know, their practice will never be anywhere greater than their home life is and their personal life and their core values. Um, the profession at large can never be anywhere further than where each individual chiropractor, chiropractic college, state association is. Um, and by that, I would say we have to be more connected. And we have to be working on helping people be more connected. Every time someone is in the leadership of our profession, now this isn't true for all professions. I say it's true for chiropractic because the basis of 98% of all chiropractic existence in patient care is in private practice. You know, not many of us work in hospitals, not many of us exclusively work in research. 98% of chiropractic function for those who even function as chiropractors is in private practice. So when the leadership of our profession, whether it's a state association, licensing bureaus, um, colleges or whatnot, when the leadership of our profession has not first had to demonstrate the competency themselves to live at least a decade, two decades, three decades in practice while having function in their marriage, while having solvency with the federal government financially and other things like that. When people who have not had to exercise competency in those areas represent the majority of the governmental and academic leadership of the profession, well then we're not connected to what chiropractic is in our own leadership. Amen. Well, you know, and, and, and look, no, no pointing fingers because if, if practicing chiropractors then after decades of practicing don't show up and volitionally put themselves in academics and political leadership and licensing bureaucracy, well, then shame on them for taking the gravy of the years of income and then not serving the more academic and gradual moving aspects of our profession in their later years. So I, mean, I would be very gradual and slow to point the finger on either side of that. We have a lot of people who, when they retire, they're just tired and checking out. And, you know, who's going to argue with them? But I would say all chiropractors, if they put in two, three, or four decades of outrageous service committed to then just two, three, four, five years of academic or political service, we would solve a great many things. I don't know that that's ever going to happen. But if I had my way, you know, the old thing, if I were president, if I were president, a certain percentage of every state association, a certain percentage of, of licensing bureaus and, and high-functioning governmental agencies, a certain percentage of, of executive boards and, and academics uh, you know, behind the leadership of colleges would have to be people who had to have lived X number of years. And I would let experts figure out what the answers to these things are. I don't know what the answers are, but, but – a certain percentage of that leadership contingency has to have exercised a certain number of years or decades of competency in that, defining with a certain clarity what competency means so that we are a government of the people and by the people. You've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession. This week's episode is brought to you by Close for Cairo. Dr. Barbara Eaton's 56-day chiropractic boot camp, Movewell University, the Black Diamond Club, Legacy Wealth Management, 
Posture Screen, Dr. Alok Trivedi, Universal Traction Systems, Vantage Point Marketing, Element Mattresses, Imaging Services, Zingit Solutions, Cairo Thin, Dr. Peter Goldman's Zone School of Healing, and Everest Chiropractic Boot Camp. Let's hustle. Man, that's powerful. And it actually makes a lot of sense because, you know, at the end of my days of being a you know, contributor to society, I just want to be a kept man and do something that I can be appreciated for. And I think that that's what a lot of people come to at the end of their days. They don't know what they want to be kept for. They just want right. to be uh, kind of exalted from any type of further activity that they've wanted to retire from. And that's the thing that I've learned about chiropractic. Most chiropractors, you know, they don't dream of not practicing long term. They dream of practicing long term, but then they get caught up in the bureaucracies. They get caught up in the audits. They get caught up in the negative uh, downstream effect of what happens politically and uh, socially out there with the media and whatnot. And they just kind of become a little downtrodden, I think, and they want to step away. And uh, it's hard for them to remain in a profession when they've been getting arrows shot at them for the past 20, 30, 40 years of their private practice. And now they're like, wow, I don't have to take on the stress of being a leader in my community anymore. I can kind of get out of the way and go out there and fade away instead of shine brighter towards the end of my days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, part of me scratches my head and say, yeah, but how many times do you go and pay money to watch a movie where ultimately one of the breakthroughs is understanding, you know, life isn't fair. Nobody said it was going to be easy. Nobody said it was going to be like this. Nobody, you know, it, this isn't fair. That isn't fair. And that's the conundrum. And in the end, you got to get up, shake off the dust and do it again. As uh, Jackson Brown said in the song, you know, you got to get up and do it again. And, you know, a lot of chiropractors, I, I was really heartbroken. You just made me think of something. I was at a state convention a few weeks ago and this young kid <laughs> raised his hand to share and he said, well, I'm done in six months. I'm 40 years old and I'm out. It's good. My practice is, is already on contract to be purchased and I'm done. I'm like, done like what? And then you're going to teach at a chiropractic college or you're going to and you go, no, I'm done. I'm out of this profession. And, and I mean, it was sad to hear that, you know, judge not lest ye be judged. I can't judge the guy for what he's doing, but I was sad. I was sad. I love this profession. I love what we do and I love anyone doing it. I love the fantasy that maybe they have a desire to do it deeper than my own, that they would inspire me to raise up more from my own. And here's this kid telling the story, and he's not alone. You know, you just said it in a way. A lot of people just want to just, whew, I'm ready to chill out. And that's true. Uh, and there's reasons to want to chill. But, you know, most people, you see patients, they say they're retired. And once they're retired, what do they do? They volunteer to work on the hospital board. They volunteer at the YMCA. They volunteer because – no man or woman truly feels a depth of virtue and value sitting home alone, just saturated in their own comfort. I mean, some do, very few really. And even if some do for a period of time, usually that only lasts a certain amount of time. We need our DCs to stay in the game. And, you know, one of the things I love about what you're doing, Jim, and you, Luke, is, you know, conversations provoke next levels of thinking. And you guys are sitting here just walking around this profession, meeting people saying, hey, I like this guy's conversation or this gal's conversation. Let's post it. You know, and I'm grateful for what you're doing. I see you out there and you guys have a lot of chatter out there in the social media world. You're doing a great job. Um, you know, I'm hoping right now this is going to stir up the fact that we got a TLC seminar coming up in Princeton, September 14th, 15th. And, you know, the chatter that goes on here is amazing. When I talk to people, I tell them your job is to make your patients chatter in the streets about chiropractic because adjusting people's spines is simple. Any mechanic can do that. But adjusting people's understanding of truth is a whole other value. And, you know, you two guys, Luke and Jim, you're doing a great thing about provoking conversations where truth is heard by more, not less, of our neighbors. Well, the big idea around what we do is to get chiropractic to live outside the four walls of chiropractic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, me walking the streets of Davenport, Iowa as a boy and as a middle-aged man and then as an adult... I didn't realize the power that I had by being a boy that grew up in that town of Davenport, Iowa. Now that I'm a man with a big voice and I have a lot of people that support and respect the work that Luke and I do together, 
Um, you never know how far reaching something that we say today will have the effect on millions tomorrow. And now we're in an earth of seven point something billion going eight billion marking, you know, people on planet Earth that all need to have the reality to be checked and adjusted for vertebral subluxation. And I just feel such an honor to be able to hold the space that we do to keep the chatter going and to be able to be those chiro hustlers that are out there, you know, promoting the truth of chiropractic and getting people on board. You know, back to BJ's quote about selling chiropractic within the law, without the law, or whatever it is, um, I've sold chiropractic too, so I know what that feels like. And it's such an honor for me to talk to the leaders in this profession and to eventually hash out a better solution for the future because now I'm connected with all the decision makers and influencers and people that are out there on the ground level and people that are out there in the, the you know, in the big seats out there that are making decisions, um, it's an honor for me to be able to shake all those hands. And which I call it, Dr. Dean, is getting uh, palm to palm, heart to heart, the knee to knee with people. And when you have that type of uh, reciprocation or rapport with people, um, the chiropractic profession will be a beautiful profession, as I call it. And the people that are in the profession and outside the profession will all talk um, happily about how their lives were impacted by the chiropractic adjustment. Mm, that's sweet. That's sweet. But, you know, to me, one of the things I experience in trying to help people is that, you know, when people are nice and come alongside each other, there's at least a greater chance they might listen to what's inside each other. And you have that kind of a footprint. You, you know, you have a very uh, gentle disposition about you. You are very positive towards people. Uh, you and Luke at these events that I see you at, you, you know, you always have a great energy in the place. Well, you know, what we've learned in TLC is that if we're going to help someone, the first thing that has to happen is they have to know that there is safety in the living room. Uh, where there's no safety, it's rare people are going to open up for change. And that's just it, Dean, is I believe that we really hold space for people and we protect this sacred trust and we protect this message. And I think that that's something that's really unique when people that I've never met before uh, take a chance to have an interview with us. And a lot of times I don't know too much about them. They don't know too much about me. And before five minutes is up, they feel completely comfortable, you know, getting naked with their message, if you will. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You know, we didn't speak as much about the one-on-one -on -one patient experience, but I would apply what we just said to that whoever you listeners are, you know, patients are constantly in the midst of your day one experience weighing out their first experience, right? You only get one shot at a first impression. In every moment, are you punctual? Are you clean? Are you coming alongside them? Are you listening to them? Well, these things are constantly playing out and you guys are wise to constantly let patients experience that you're coming alongside them. You can't surrender your position to go there. You have to be a doctor of chiropractic and yet be morally beside them. Seek first to understand. There's, there's so much to be gained from applying to your doctor-patient experience, what we're talking about applying to the profession's leadership experience. So. So tell us some of your marketing strategies. How do you spread your message to your audiences? Well, there was an old TV show when I was a kid called Perry Mason, and one of the <laughs> adages of the Perry Mason show was the truth needs no defense. So the most critical thing about promotions and marketing to me is I put a hyphen in the word, P-R-O hyphen motion, that truly great doctors of any specialty or any profession are truly great at being pro putting truth into motion. Uh, I don't seek to get patients in, I seek to put truth out. When I put truth out, people come in. You know, one of the adages that we have in our own profession is that new patients don't come to you, they come from you. When, you're, when your intentions are genuine and sincere, when what comes out of your mouth is truthfulness with kindness and, and, and clarity, well, then the people who are in need and know they are, they will step forward and seek you and they will come to you. So one of the things we do about promotions and marketing 
is that we're all about putting truth out and making sure that's the objective in everything we do. Now, how do we do that? Well, first and foremost, you know, Latin is a fundamental to the romantic languages, right? So if someone's going to really become a linguist and become extraordinary at reading and writing multiple languages of the romantic element, they learn Latin. Well, one of the fundamentals of promotions and marketing is the doctor of chiropractic knowing how to talk to someone about asking for referrals. If you don't know how to competently, eloquently, respectfully, and appropriately ask for referrals, well, pretty much everything else you do in PR, you're going to suck at as well <laughs> because you know you may be putting a great social media image out there, but you're not calling to people to action with elegance and grace and whatnot. So the first thing I know that people have to do is they have to learn how to talk to other people. And in so, they have to then learn how to bring up and address the significance of them getting checked. Another thing is to understand what we teach in TLC is called the pipeline. That as the water moves through the pipe, it is successful. It may not have gotten into the mouth of the needy drinker at the other end of the pipe yet, but the water is successful. And we have to celebrate that the water is moving through the pipe, even though it might not have gotten to my dry, parched mouth. The water is coming. So the principle in promotions and marketing is if you get to say a hello to someone, that's good. Now, I would like to do more than say hello to them. I would hope that somehow we have a conversation. And if we have a conversation, that's good. Well, I would hope to do more than have a conversation. I would hope the conversation somehow gets to health care and somehow gets to somehow, you know, being maybe about chiropractic. But if it's just a conversation just about health care, that's good though I will persist and hope for more. And then if we get to chiropractic, that's even more good. But sometimes chiropractors are so eager to say, I gotta get them in and get them checked, I gotta adjust their necks, that you know, it's kinda like meeting the woman of your dreams the first time, and instead of saying hello, you, know, you say, hey, wanna make babies or something, and you're just totally out of context, you're dysfunctional, you're broken down, and you're, you know, you're kinda out of sorts, you're, you're not eloquent, you're not disciplined, you're not trained, you're not safe for people to be around. So the pipeline says, be competent at every juncture along the pipeline and be the kind of person that's grateful for every inch of the pipeline. And you're never embittered or, or wishing for things that aren't appropriate yet to wish for, but that you dream you have your lighthouse in the distance while you know that every inch you're in is perfect. There's nothing on earth that isn't exactly somehow, even in the sad moments, somehow the way it's supposed to be to get us to that next place. So promotions and marketing, first people have to understand it's about putting truth out. Second, you have to learn to speak to people, which means you have to learn the eloquence of the most fundamental of skills, which is how do you ask for referrals. Next, you have to then celebrate the pipeline of all the things that lead to someone getting in your office. The next discipline I teach about is that it's about getting people checked, not getting them adjusted. Think of how clean and liberating it is to say to someone, look, you know, I don't know that you need chiropractic care. I mean, I believe anyone breathing needs chiropractic care, but it may not be the first thing of order for you. And if you need chiropractic care, I don't know that I'm the best chiropractor for you. I believe I'm the best chiropractor on earth, but each person has their own needs. I don't know that you need to get adjusted right now, but one thing I do know, if you're breathing, which you are, you need to get Checked. checked. That's it. Just get checked. You know, I did this with you when we were at the seminar. We did it with a room full of 500 people or so. You know, what if we could just say to people, look, you need to get checked. I don't know if you need care. And, and if you need care, I don't know if I'd be the right doctor for you. And if I, you know, and if I was, I, look, what's most important right now, let's just slow things down. You need to get checked. And when a doctor that carries reverence and respect of themselves and others says to someone, look, you need to get checked. Most of humanity wants to meet an intelligent doctor and ask their advice and receive it. So for God's sakes, just step up as a chiropractor and be that and tell people you need to get checked. I mean, I must say that six times a day, every day to someone not even having anything to do with my practice. You know, I'm like, well, you know what? You did, I just did. I was at a sign shop today, right? I'm, I'm changing the name and, and my practice and blah, blah, blah. And I, was, I said, you know what, Sue, you need to get checked. I said, so because we were working on something, I said, well, who's your chiropractor? He goes, oh, I haven't needed one. I said, so you've never been to a chiropractor? She said, no. I said, you've never gotten your spine checked? She said, no, I haven't needed it. I said, well, understand, that's like saying I don't need water. 
well, your body needs water. You might not be thirsty at this moment, but you need water. If you have a spine and you're breathing, your spine needs to be checked because it is constantly strained and stressed. So again, in the moment, we have to know how to talk to people. So I have a pipeline of all these different things, expansion and renewal cycles. You understand that if you go to the gym, you want to work out a muscle, then you got to give it a day to recover. And in the renewal cycle, it gains more strength, so then you can work it out again. Well, doctors don't understand that promotions and marketing should be mapped out a year or two years in advance so that you you express exhaustion where you do all kinds of marketing and then you take six seven eight weeks off and you do renewal cycles then you do eight ten twelve weeks on where you're spending more time energy and money then you spend six seven eight weeks off and you're recovering your CAs get a break so chiropractic practices need to move through expansion and renewal cycles this is another tool of promotions and marketing we teach a promotions and marketing matrix you have to have balances of internal marketing external marketing marketing that costs time and energy versus marketing that costs money so the matrix you make out the four boxes and you have to know what how to fill those and this is something we teach um and last on the the docket but certainly not least is your social media you've got to have all your social media indexes out there but understand something if jim chester has extraordinary social media and Jim Chester has met 2,000 people face-to-face -face in the streets of his town. And Luke Millett has awesome social media, just as good as James, maybe even a, a percentage point greater. But Luke has never met anyone in the streets. Whose social media is going to win? The guy who has been face-to-face -face in the streets always wins. Because when someone sees you in social media and they know they've met you, all the other chatter goes down into quietness. So we teach our doctors to be extraordinary at social media, but not at the sacrifice of thinking that's enough. You need to be in the streets. So Jim Chester, you're in social media big time. And where are you? You're at every doggone event I happen to travel to somewhere. You're in some crevice of the building doing something. <laughs> because you put yourself in the darn streets. There are too many chiropractors coming out of school wanting to think, well, I'm a doctor. I shouldn't have to be at talks or screenings or writing articles or shaking the hands of the mayor. You better darn well be in the streets because it's in the street that the brokenhearted reside. You belong in the streets. So we teach something in the office called the four things a doctor does. Most valuably, a doctor should do what? Adjust. What if there's nobody in the building to adjust? Well, then you should serve your new patients. What if there's no new patients? Then you train with your team for three minutes. Well, what if there's no one to adjust, no new patients, and you trained with your team already? Get out of the building. You don't belong in there. And what you should be doing is one of the pipeline of activities that put you in conversation with other people and so on and so forth. So, um, there's a lot of structure in TLC. We are extremely disciplined, but not at the price of community and coming alongside and connecting. So, I mean, I could, I could talk for two days on your question of what do we do for promotions and marketing. Uh, we teach the most extraordinary outside uh, talk programs where, you know, you have to be able to speak on chiropractic. And any of the good groups that are really helping the profession right now have realized you have to teach people how to teach people. I mean, after all, that is one of the fundamental definitions of being a doctor. That's, that's old news. Well, you, you touched on a lot of stuff there, Doc. And I guess I have a, a, a very smooth, easy question for you that's really robust. And it's, what does it mean for you to be a coach to all of these fantastic chiropractic leaders? It means I really need to pause and I need to look in the mirror and I need to be in the front lines of what they do while I'm on the podiums of talking to them about how to do it. It means that in my idle moments, I get back to the adjusting tables and in the spoken moments, I better have prepared to deliver not just from my heart, but with competency on the specifics. It means that ultimately I'm raising up other coaches and not me. TLC is not the Dean and Jen program. TLC is now a movement of young women and doctor leaders who are driving this thing. The objective here is I tell every doctor, if you drop dead and six months later your practice folded up, all you were doing was feeding your own mouth. 
But if you drop dead as a doctor of chiropractic in practice and the CAs symbolically step over the body and say, where's the next chiropractor? Well, then you've built a mission. So what TLC and coaching is about is that we have already built up succession upon succession such that this program is going to last forever because it isn't about me and it ain't about money. It's about truth and community. So the objective here, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll lay you in on the inside story. So a lot of recovered alcoholics in my childhood, in my family. And if not for 12-step programs, I mean, I might not even be alive right now. I had a gun-wielding uncle I lived in home with and blah, blah, blah. So I watched the 12-step program be extraordinary. And it wasn't until I was in college that I learned that 12-step programs, you have to dig to even find out who founded it. And when you go to it, to work the program is to have to work the steps. To work the steps, you have sponsors and coaches, per se, that you have to work with. And once you work with them, part of it is you become a sponsor and a coach. And the cycle goes round. TLC is that for the whole chiropractic profession. It's a giant program that says, you don't get any stage time if you don't do front game play. And to do front game playing is to be competent at serving those doing stage time and vice versa. So one of the extraordinary things TLC is doing is acting as a filtering tool to clean up, raise up, and build up more great leadership for the future of our profession with no ultimate end where you're going to find my name. Someday my dream is that as people are served as doctors of chiropractic in chiropractic using TLC, People will be in hallways in a hotel saying, by the way, who founded this movement? And they're like, I don't know. It doesn't really <laughs> matter if the movement is right, does it? So let's talk about you personally a little bit. What kind of things do you like to listen to and read in your spare time? Are you in the middle of any good books right now? Yeah, always a lot of good books. I mean, there's a lot of new books people have put on um, – on my my nightstand and and I get through them and read them. Um, I love listening to music. I listen to every eclectic kind of music out there. I love listening to my pastor, Pastor Joe Foch, all the time. He doesn't know it. I, I'm in one of these churches where I'm there whenever I'm not on the road, which isn't often. I'm, I'm on the road about 36 weekends a year, but uh, when I'm home, I'm listening to Joe and then reading my own books uh, of the Bible. Uh, I read Ogmandino's. I mean, the, the blue book in, in the 12-step program really got me back to choosing my vertical relationship more competently. Uh, my my worldview questions got answered. So, I mean, I read my Bible every morning. I read Ogmandino's Greatest Secret in the World and the Scrolls. Uh, probably once a year, once every two years, I go through that whole thing. It's a nine-month process to read that book, so I read that over and over and over again. Um, 40 Days to Joy is one that I've just read for probably the fourth time. I like to go back to books that are great. You know, people are like, what's the latest book? Well, how about you actually do what you read in one of the good ones 10 years ago? Uh, <laughs> you know, we don't need to keep reading more books if we just did the stuff that was in the good ones we read, right? Um but there are great new ones. I can't remember the one. There's one I'm working on, Difficult Relationships, I think it was one of the ones I'm reading right now. Difficult, yeah, I think that's one of the ones. Oh, uh, The War of Art, one of the all-time greats to me. Um, I don't know. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah. That sounds yeah. like some interesting stuff. I journal every morning. I, I get up every morning at 425 to 445, somewhere around there. I am in my gym. Usually by 5 to 5 or 5 o'clock. I am out of my gym by about 10 to 6 and I'm in a coffee shop. I'm immediately reading my passages within about 10, 15, 20 minutes. Then I journal and write for about 10, 15, 20 minutes. I teach weekend camps on journaling. Journaling is a really big deal. And then I write gas cards. Oh, you asked me what one of my favorite apps was. Uh, I use WhatsApp out the wazoo because we create incredible communities of people connected on different things. I share gas cards with about five to 600 chiropractors every morning. Gas cards, the acronym stands for gratitudes, actions, and selfless service. And we all write those things down every morning and then we send them to each other every morning. Um, How do I get on that? 
<laughs> uh, just text me and say you want to do it. I'll put you in one of our groups and we'll be sharing them together. I'm in. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> My dream is that uh, of the 68 to 72,000 licenses that so supposedly exist, and rumor has it barely 40 to 45,000 of them are actually in some version of a practice and active uh, licenses. My dream is you know, that we'll get to a point where half of that number is all sharing gratitudes every morning. Imagine men and women waking up and the first things they chatter about isn't fear, angst, debt, worry, insurance companies, audits, and everything else, but they wake up feeling gratitude joy grace elegance appreciation smiles with each other that'd be amazing yeah that sounds awesome i'm definitely in and i I guess this is off of the uh the path that we were on we were going to start closing up with you but i'm really interested how do you keep your personal consistency and motivation with traveling so much because I personally am having a challenge right now just making sure that I stay on my path that I'm on and not uh, losing my momentum because as you know and you've stated, I do travel quite a bit and I'm always somewhere new. Right, right. You know, I was just talking to my 17-year-old last night. I went in his bedroom and just sat there and I was appreciative that I was home and I was appreciative I could just be with him. and. I'm sitting there talking about things and he asked me what I was going to do tomorrow morning. I said, well, you know what I'm going to do tomorrow morning. And he said, so you do that no matter what. I said, well, David, you know, I love disciplines. I love consistencies. I love things that make my life be more simple. So, yeah, I love all that. And particularly, David, I said, you know, my life on the road is really hard. I mean, it's a lot easier for me to stay home and be in practice than to be on the road. And I said, you know, these disciplines that I keep up with at home make it a little more likely that on the road I'll stick with them. So, for instance, you know, I fly to the West Coast, suddenly I'm three hours different in a time zone. And then waking up the next morning, I got a lecture maybe at nine, but that means I got to be up rehearsing my, my talk and getting my head in space. You know, I have to, I have to live the disciplines that are right no matter where I am or what the circumstances are. It's that usual thing. Circumstances can't define the man, they just reveal him. So if me being in airports or living in hotels or having a a fragmented schedule that constantly changes makes me weak on choosing the right foods and exercising every day, well then the circumstances just revealed me. They didn't define me. They revealed that I was weak in my disciplines every day. So I need help. So I need friends checking in on me. I need my board of advisors texting me saying, Dean, how you doing? You're on your third day. Did you exercise today? What's going on? I need my friends. I need my community of like-minded people who choose great disciplines because discipline leads to what? Freedom. So how do I keep it together on the road? I've accumulated awesome disciplines when I'm home and when I'm on the road, I seek friendships with people that help me hold accountable to it. One of the things we do in TLC leadership is men are not allowed to travel with women other than their spouses on the road on business trips. All right. Unless they're together as paired couples, we never break up couples. Men by themselves shouldn't travel alone, period. They should be with other men and held accountable to high standards. Alcohol is something that should be out of the question or kept in incredible check because it weakens the man or woman from choosing the most wise disciplines of the day. I mean, the list goes on, but what's funny is I couldn't say anything to you that you don't already know. You know all this. But are you surrounded? You know, do you and Luke keep each other in check? I bet you do. And I believe you do. And regardless of what you do, I'm only going to see it that way that that is what you do because I want to see the best in others. So how I keep it together on the road is I keep all the people that need to hold me accountable close in my exchanges, phone calls, FaceTime calls, texting. I keep my phone on radar check so my family always knows where I am every minute and they know where I am. So we're accountable at all times. I don't know. Hope that helps. No, it's beautiful. I appreciate the honesty and the openness for for uh you know there's things that might not affect me as much as it will affect the 5,000th listen to this episode you know there might be somebody out there that was just waiting for that question to be asked and answered so a lot of the times i don't only ask questions based on my personal gain because i love to be able to be interactive with uh our um interviewers 
and I, I like to be able to interact on a personal level, but I also like to ask engaging questions that it might help somebody else out there that might be struggling with their personal development or their discipline or you know certain aspects of their life when it comes to relationships with their spouse or you know you might have just brought something up up to people that uh, traveling with somebody that's not your spouse you know some things that they can learn from themselves as to what to do and what not to do and that's just through repetition of success and you know leading from the front like what you do and like you said, whether it's from the podium or it's uh, the gratitude messages in the morning, consistency is something that matters. And that's something that will carry on leadership long after we're either celebrated or forgotten. Mm. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. You know, my dream is that somebody listening to this right now feels moved and then inspired and then safe enough that you pick up the phone or you get on the website and you seek to have conversations. One of the th my favorite things to do every week, I block out four hours a week to do what's called a discovery session with a chiropractor. And I help them construct their statement of desire so that they're more clear about what they want and their core value for themselves is elevated. And quite often at the end of those calls, I might not talk to that person for a few years or ever again. Or at the end of that conversation, we've opened such a great dialogue. We don't need to close a deal on anything, but we're going to connect in other ways. But what I love to do is to connect with chiropractors, help them write their statement of desire. And whatever further connection is appropriate that needs to come from that organically shows up. That's how I do promotions and marketing. I open conversations. I never close a deal. But in opening conversations, when hearts are touched, I make sure that I do something that helps them heal. And when you or I feel a little healed, then we tend to step up the plate and do a little bit more. So, <laughs> Amen. I love what you did here. Amen. So before we wrap up this episode, we have one last final question for you. Whoa. What is one piece of advice you have for any chiropractic entrepreneurs out there? <sighs> Choose wisely the coach and stewardship that surrounds you. Not choosing a good coach is not an option. I'm not only saying choose one, I'm saying choose them carefully and wisely and know that their advice in business can mean no greater or po more positive than their existence is in their home life. That's beautiful. And to wrap things up, is there anything that we didn't ask you that you'd like to share with our audience today? Yeah, my son who graduated from UCLA and loves social media has been lighting it up for TLC. And I would be remiss if I did not point out that on Instagram, one of our listings is tlc 4 ulife So it's TLC, the number four, the letter U dot life. On Instagram, you'll see all kinds of amazing stuff there. And that'll link you right to our website, which would be great. Uh, please, 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 somebody Give me a love tap and tell me you're going to be there September 14th, 15th in Princeton. Not only do we have the extraordinary TLC community lineup, uh, the seminar is a Friday-Saturday gig. It starts on Friday at 11. It goes till Saturday at 4. We have tandem classes for CAs. We teach PACE-certified CA certification programs. Uh, Deed Harrison is going to be there teaching CBP. Uh, Hugo Gibson is going to be there teaching the, the core values of what's happening as chairman of the board. Uh, for the ICA. Uh, Edwin Cordero is going to be there lecturing on behalf of his collegiate presidency and the uh, initiatives and objectives of Sherman College. Um, oh gosh, uh, Dave Smith is going to be there teaching on Medicare compliance documentation and maximum dollar visit average. 
Uh, gosh, there's more. And plus, there's so many TLC coaches that are going to be teaching there. Fire, Friday night is fire, uh, fire and brimstone principles and philosophy while uh, the day runs very uh, linear and structured competencies of the what's called the annual strategic planning initiative that at the close of September's event, September 14th, and the, that the doctors are going to have written out their entire 2019 calendar for expansion and renewal cycles for promotions and increase your volume um, and it's just a beautiful weekend and anybody can come you don't have to be in TLC to be there just come and have a great weekend together well I think we're gonna have to schedule a Facebook live with you and Jim here shortly because I don't think this episode will come out until October oh okay. <laughs> well I hope you all had a good time at the September seminar <laughs> <laughs> No, no, we'll get something scheduled with you and Jim so everyone knows all about the uh, seminar coming up. And that just about wraps it up, and I want to thank you for being our guest today. Thank you. You know, you guys, uh, I really love meeting you. Luke, you are are that low-profile, you know, you are not looking for center stage, but when you take action and do what you're doing your competencies are glaringly evident so it was really nice meeting you thank you thank you it was also uh, really nice meeting you at uh focus okc yeah that was great all right guys so um i appreciate it well yeah dean thank you so much for your time and your energy and your message for everybody i just want to close out by saying you're just one story away keep hustling mm. thanks Beautiful. brother thank you bye Thanks for listening to Cairo Hustle. Don't forget to subscribe and check back next week to continue hustling.